Hey guys, welcome to today's show. Uh, this one is not like a normal show, so it's a little bit graphic in nature and um, it's a little scary, but true. So uh, I suggest you consider changing the video if you don't like scary, true graphic stories. So now would be the time to maybe watch a different video, but uh, I definitely want to cover these stories because they're true and important to cover that uh, we can learn something from these situations, especially as hunters. Um, okay, so now that we got that over with, and uh, before we start with today's scary story, make sure you click that like, hit that subscribe button, uh, and let's get started. The trial begins for a Minnesota man accused in the Wisconsin hunting rampage killing. There are six counts of first degree intentional homicide with use of a dangerous weapon. Were racial slurs used? Was Chai Vang threatened by the hunting party? And did anyone in that hunting party that confronted Chai Vang actually fire their own weapons? How did this thing turn into a war? Did they fire a shot at him? Was that true? Did he feel, did they fire a warning shot? Something had to have happened to make him snap into this war mode. Our first story uh, that we're gonna talk about is from Wisconsin where a trespassing goes wrong. A situation where someone gets lost, a hunter gets lost, ends up in a tree stand on private land, not on purpose, on accident. A hunting party finds him and it turns bad pretty quick. Chang Vang was born on September 24th, 1968 in Laos. And Chai Vang's story um, is very typical of the Hmong American story in that his father served with the CIA uh, as a foot soldier during the secret wars in Laos. And Chai Vang was seven years old when he left the country of Laos. The Hmong people in Ethnic Hill Tribe uh, were, were Laotian by nationality, but were, by ethnicity were Hmong. So we're ethnic hill tribes living in central Laos, in the mountains of Laos. And during the Vietnam War conflict uh, in, the, in the 60s, the CIA came into Laos and met up with Hmong leaders and said, hey, we, we need you to fight with us, with the American CIA to prevent communists to, from taking over Laos. You fight for us, we'll take care of you. We'll provide the weapons, you provide the soldiers. So thus began this alliance of Hmong American CIA fighting side by side on the same side against the communist insurgency, which was an alliance that lasted over 15 years. And after 1975, the Americans returned home. After they left, pretty much the communists took over, overthrew the government. They said, well, we'll seek out the Hmong. And literally, there are secret documents circulating around the new government saying, annihilate the Hmong, kill the Hmong, especially those who sided with the CIA. That's when the exodus, Hmong exodus happened. A lot of Hmong soldiers, especially those who fought with the CIA, left Laos into the refugee camps in Thailand. And they eventually qualified for what they call political asylum to come to America. Chai Vang came to this country at the age of 12. Uh, like many families, moved around uh, to, to be with relatives and ultimately graduated from high school. He was a guy who uh, wanted to serve his country, who volunteered to join the National California National uh, Guard. In his service as, uh, in the National Guard, he achieved a uh, sharpshooter status. Sometime around 2000, Vang and his family moved to the Twin Cities capital of St. Paul, neighboring Minneapolis, Minnesota. On the weekend of the shooting, Vang went out deer hunting with two friends and their sons in northwest Wisconsin, a region where deer hunting is particularly popular east of Birchwood, Wisconsin, around the town of Meteor. It is believed that Vang and his friends began their day on public land, but he later went on to private 400-acre parcel. So during this time, Vang gets lost, separated from his hunting party, and ends up on this 400-acre piece of land. On Sunday, November 21st, a hunting party of about 15 people were in a cabin on this private property. Terry Wilers, one of the two co-owners of the land, left the cabin and saw Vang sitting in a deer stand. Wilers used a handheld radio to radio back, asking whether or not people were using the stand or if someone should be in it. Upon getting the response that no one should be in it, he approached Vang and told him to leave the property. 
Vang then apologized and started moving south towards a trail through a forested area of the property. According to Terry Weiler's testimony, as Bob got back on the radio, he asked me where he was at, and I says, uh, he's heading south down the food plot right now. So I know that he already talked to me, and they probably come in after me. In the woods from the old stand, I could see the ATV pull up in front of him. I know Bob had raised his voice at one particular point where I did hear him say that tree stands didn't grow out of the sight of trees. He asked him, what were you doing in my son's tree stand? Do you think the fucker grew there by itself? What, you on my son's stand? Did you then I say, uh, yes. He said, you on my son's stand? And then I say, uh, I didn't know what your stand. Bob asked him, uh, what are you doing here? Do you know you're on private land? Do you know you are trespassing 400 acres of land, you dang goo? Bob stated, do you know you came across 400 acres of private land to get here? Lauren has, Mr. Lauren has has come in close to my right a little bit, and I two person, um, uh, Mr. Mark Wright and Mr. Dennis Drew, jump out from the ATV. So when that time I thought they were gonna beat me or something. So he said, what the hell you think you're going, then gook? Then I said, excuse me. I started moving a little bit to the left, and he stabbed one more time, blocking me, so he, he He's coming close behind me. So I thought he's going to hit me or something. So he just uh, yanked his hand, flicked my backpack, my uh, license. So he started reading two or three times. And then after they wrote it down, and he said, he said, a matter of fact, I'm going to turn that to DNR. That will teach him a, a lesson. We figured it was done. We're getting back in the fort. And uh, Rhino and Mark had gotten back on his ATV. And that time they start turning the ATV around. I told Bob to stop. Something was wrong. Something was different. I also turned around and looking back, I observed, see Mr. Terry Weller take off his rifle from his right side, just take it off. Now, during this time when you're looking back, why do you keep looking back? Because I, I'm afraid they might do something. Um, they already uh, cast their knees. I'm, I'm afraid. I don't know what's going on. Up until this point, He'd been carrying his gun similar to the way he was holding it, holding on to the butt plate with one hand laying over his arm, and I couldn't see the gun anymore. It was around in front of his body. As he took his gun off his shoulder and brought it down, and I just took my gun off my shoulder and brought it around to the front of me. And he started to come around with his with his gun, and I held my gun out in front of me and believing that he was going to shoot at me, I said, don't you shoot. I don't know who said it, several people, maybe one, but they said, stop, don't shoot, just get the hell out of here. I thought, in my heart, I thought they couldn't shoot me, he's going to shoot me. So I immediately dropped to my right, dropped to my right into a crouch. At that time, because I always have my hands on, on the slain all the time. So I just slammed it, went down uh, to my uh, left, drop it, and when I drop it, I see, I, I, I hear a fire going on. I see in front of me, that's, because that's go uh, up, that incline. I see some uh, dirt splash around about 40, 50 feet away in front of me. Now, now Mr. Bang, you say fire, what, what do you mean, is that a shot? A gunshot, gunshot. And you said that you saw something past you in the distance. When I drop in the, like this, I look directly in front of me to the south. I saw some, I saw the uh, uh, dirt splash around right in front, about 40, 50 feet away. Did that mean anything to you? That mean, to my mind, he shot me and he missed me. So that time I removed my scope. I don't know where I drop it in or throw away. I just removed it. He made one smooth move came around and pointed the gun directly at Terry Willers. At that point, I took off running as hard as I could to the right. I turned my gun around. As I turned around already on his direction, I already fired already. First shell, I could hear whistle past me. I shot him one more time. And in a split second, I felt the burn. We were like rats scrambling. 
three of the four were hit by multiple rounds. Bang is believed to have fired about 20 rounds total. One, one of the wounded hunters died the next day, bringing the toll to six dead and two wounded. Vang fled the scene on foot and discarded his remaining ammunition, later saying he did not want to shoot anyone else. With testimony of both survivors now complete, the defense will try to show inconsistencies in their accounts. Willers says he never fired his weapon at Vang. Hesbeck, though, at one point told his wife he thought Willers did. I told my wife I thought Terry returned fire. In another discrepancy, Willers saying Vang was not repeatedly cursed at and could have walked away. Hesbeck, though, reluctantly admitting that in earlier statements said that Vang was lambasted with profanity and that at one point Joe Crotto did prevent him from leaving. As if you wanted to leave the area, Joey Crotto blocked the suspect's path. The jury's toughest decision will be deciding who actually shot first. Charges, three first degree attempted murder charges. His sentence will be life imprisonment once again. Chai Vang found guilty on all nine charges against him. There's a lot of victims in this scenario, um, a lot of people who are just there for the party, so it's really a sad thing. However, I think it's important to note that, I mean, reading into this story, um, I don't get the feeling that. Cha Vang meant to, he didn't go there uh, in my opinion to hurt people I think the scenario went bad but I guess I never been in a situation where someone tells you leave you leave you apologize and then you get confronted again and they stop you with a huge group of people so I can see how it could be a little overwhelmingly scary um, I wouldn't start open firing on anybody obviously if if they weren't like pushing me or but maybe grabbing his tag maybe he thought he was trying to pull him down or so i don't know i understand like if you own land you're going to be upset if someone's on your land i don't think it's smart or reasonable to approach someone twice um and yell at them or you know make comments especially when they're holding a loaded weapon um people are unstable in different ways so you don't know what they're going to do i mean i think it's i think the first action was appropriate by the the initial you know, please leave, you're on the wrong land. And I think at that point, they should have just observed to make sure he left the land. But a sad story all the way around. I don't think it worked out for anybody. I don't think the intent was, you know, like first degree intent uh, in any way, shape or form. I do feel that when reading through these stories, and I don't think that his intent was to go there to hurt people. I think he got nervous, got scared. You know, really, you need to be on the lookout, be aware of your surroundings while you're hunting. I wanted to bring, there's more of these stories coming because I just want to make sure people are aware of them because sometimes you just don't realize that these things are happening. Maybe you've never heard these stories and they are sad and they are scary. And um, it is very critical that you protect yourself and know what the limitations are, know what your limitations are. At least think about these things in scenario format, right? What would I do in this scenario? Um, how would I react? What is the best possible reaction? Also put yourself in their position being a different race. Um, were, did they feel intimidated by these people? Did they feel, you know, that these people were trying to hurt them? Be safe, be careful. I hope you learned something today and uh, more of these stories coming. And again, if it's not for you, you know, maybe skip this video at all, but uh, make sure you subscribe, like, and we'll see you next time on BHP.